因为呢，也是刚才可能有和一些同学沟通啊，然后因为有学校有课，所以可能有这个同学还没有来，可能稍后再过来。但是因为这个行程比较紧，所以我说现在我就先开始。嗯，所以先呢，感谢就是今天有一些我们的分家教授，然后还有一些工程师，包括就是福晋院校、各大院校的同学们，非常感谢你们今天可以来参加我们这个活动。嗯，我自我介绍一下，我是程小玉，呃，原名是 Angela 程，是 c o n o s 这边负责中国市场以及就是这个中国大陆港台地区所有市场，还有就是公关的活动。嗯，下面呢，先请允许我邀请我们所有的这次代表团的团员到舞台上，我给大家逐一介绍一下。首先，我向大家介绍一下中间这位是 Neil Travis 先生啊，他是 Corner School 的主席啊，同时也是 Nvidia 就是移动内容的副总裁。嗯 ，Neil Travis 先生。现、嗯、在他右边的这位女士是 Elizabeth Rigger， 她是我们 Corner School 的执行总监，主要是负责所有市场运营，然后包括一些市场活动的工作。嗯在他右边的是 Eric， Eric 呢也是，他是来自欧洲，同时呢也是，呃，因为 Conos 有很多不同专题的工作小组，他是其中两个工作小组的组长 ，Eric。还有右呃右边这两位呢，他们是来自 JPR 的一个一个叫 JPR John p e g g y Research 的一个康呃一个公司，这个也是一个行业里边非常著名的一个呃研究的这么一个公司，呃是 John p e g g y 然后 Cassidy。今天他们也会为我们带来非常精彩的一些演讲，包括一些讨论的环节。可能就是有一些同学在大学里面看的一些教材呀、啊、什么的，有很多都是报告，是张派迪先生写的。I guess t o t a l maybe some reports they read it、uh, from your company, you are very leading company in this industry. <笑><笑>然后这边的话是呃 Tom Tom Olson， 他是来自 ARM 公司，然后是在美国那边，这次也是过来和我们分享一些专业技术上的一些演讲。旁边这位年轻人是来自英国，他是 c o l i n 是来自英国我们的一个会员的公司，叫 c o d e p l a y 今天也会介绍一些技术方面的内容。嗯，在右边那两位是呃来自日本我们的日本会员公司 Takumi 的 Tommy and Terry， 嗯，他们也会介绍一些技术方面的内容。然后旁边那位是呃来自韩国的会员公司 h u a n 他呃是 h u a n 公司的 CTO， 嗯，黄永利先生。然后最后这位是也是我们 Color Scoop 负责日本市场所有工作的，呃 k a i s a s a n 先生。所以最后也是代表我们整个团队非常感谢今天大家来这边。嗯，我们希望今天是一个非常开放的一个方式。呃，我们是以一种学习的态度来到这边，向大家介绍 Color s 包括我们呃即将推出的一个 k a i s a 的培训项目。也希望大家在整个的会议过程中，如果有任何的问题的话，可以随时的和我们交流和沟通。好，谢谢。所以我们现在就开始今天的第一部分，就是由我们 Conos 主席 Neil t r a v i s 先生向大家做一个 Conos 的概述的介绍。谢谢。Hello everyone. Thank you for coming this morning.、Uh, I'm going to start the day、uh, by giving you an overview of the Conos Group and the activities and the standards and the processes. Thank you. That we use to create、uh, the open standards, and then during the day,、um, the, 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 my colleagues you've just seen will give you more details on the APIs、uh, that we produce. So, Chronos is an open standards organization.、Uh, we create、uh, application programming interfaces or APIs. They are the ways that applications connect to、uh, accelerator silicon. Silicon for advanced functionality like 3D graphics,、uh, video, audio, compute processing,、uh, visual and sensor processing. We have around 15 different standards that are being actively developed, and we are open in two ways. Any company is welcome to join the Chronos Group to help、uh, create the standards, and the standards that we Create are freely available, openly available to the industry for、uh, anyone to use. Using our APIs, software developers are able to tap into the power of advanced silicon to create great applications. The Chronos standards play、uh, a key role in the mobile industry, particularly.、Uh, the Chronos APIs define the new functionality. That appears in each generation of mobile devices. 
to define and expand the capability of those mobile devices and to make them more and more capable. Over the last few years, mobile devices have now obtained 3D graphics. They're attaining more and more cameras and sensor processing, parallel processing, and this trend will continue into the future and the functionality will be defined by the APIs that the Kronos Group uh, creates. The APIs that we uh, create are very close to the silicon. They're very foundation uh, functionality. So this functionality is needed on almost every operating system and every platform. It means that the standards are being adopted across many different devices. Uh, Kronos APIs are shipping on uh, millions and millions of devices across multiple OS's. And one of the reasons they are so popular is that they are free to use. There is no royalty uh, to pay. So Kronos has been uh, in existence for over uh, 10 years. Uh, we were created back in the year 2000. And in 2003, our first mobile API, OpenGLES, for 3D graphics, and Tom Olson, who is the chair of OpenGLES, will give you more details. In 2004, we created OpenMax for video, camera, and image processing, uh, OpenVG for 2D vector graphics, and again, you'll hear more details on these later today. Uh, OpenSL, DS, and Collada uh, joined Kronos in 2005. OpenGL was the original 3D API created by Silicon Graphics, uh, for desktop workstations, and in 2006, uh, Silicon Graphics handed over the control of OpenGL to uh, the Kronos Group. In 2008, we started to uh, develop OpenCL, so OpenGL for graphics, OpenCL for compute. OpenCL is a parallel computation uh, framework, and uh, we'll get more details on that from Colin later in the day. And then, most recently, starting to develop APIs for HTML5 and the web. WebGL for bringing 3D graphics to uh, HTML5. And then in 2011, a whole set of new APIs. WebCL for compute in the web. Uh, OpenVL for vision acceleration. And Stream Input for sensor and input processing. So you can see that over the years, Kronos has been developing more and more uh, APIs as the market demands. We now have 100 members, actually over 100 members, and 15 active standards. This is the list of the companies that are uh, Kronos members. We have many silicon vendors, uh, many platform vendors like Apple and Google. Uh, we have uh, middleware vendors, tools vendors, phone OEMs, uh, mobile carriers, uh, application developers. So we get a good, uh, wide perspective on what are the demands for uh, the uh, APIs that we produce. And we are proud that over 30% of our membership is uh, Asian, um, but uh, not China yet. So we have uh, members from Japan, Taiwan, uh, Korea, uh, but no members yet from uh, China, which is one reason that we are here this week. And the Kronos Board of Directors has made outreaching to Chinese uh, universities and industry uh, a high priority for the Kronos Group, so we can uh, engage with Kronos uh, and the Chinese industry to uh, help the Chinese industry participate in the creation of these uh, global international standards. So how does Kronos uh, work? Uh, how do we create these open standards? Um, we start by gathering requirements uh, for future silicon APIs. We draft specifications to meet those requirements. The draft specifications are confidential to the Kronos Group. Once they're complete, we release uh, the specifications. We also create conformance tests. Uh, so people that are implementing the specifications can test the functionality and then finally companies release products. Now if companies actually join the Kronos Group, they get a number of advantages. They can see the requirements gathering process. 
it's like a window into the future. Uh, what will future silicon functionality uh, be in mobile devices? Uh, the requirements are often gathered four or five years before uh, the devices will ship, so you can tell what will be coming in the future. Members also have a voice in how the applications, uh, how the specifications are developed, so they can vote and express their opinion to make sure that their market requirements are being met. And because they see the specifications being drafted, they can begin to develop their products in parallel before the specifications are made publicly available. It means that members can often ship their products using the latest standards one or two years before non-member companies. And of course, because they're using open standards that have been agreed by the industry, the, uh, the products are aligned with this whole process um, and aligned with the needs of the industry. So how is Kronos organized to enable that process? We have one working group uh, per API, so we have around 15 different working groups. The members can be contributors, which is the normal membership that gives them a full vote in the creation of the specifications. They can be promoters, which gives them a seat on the board of directors uh, that gets to decide strategy and budget. Uh, but it's still one company, one vote uh, in the working groups. We also have academic membership. So a university can join the Kronos group and participate uh, in this creation process too. The work working groups create specifications that define the APIs and uh, also conformance tests and a program by which companies using the specification can formally test their products. And of course, documentation and sample code, uh, reference cards, so developers can understand how to use uh, the specifications too. People in the industry, companies who want to adopt the standards can become an adopter. There's a small fee to get access to the conformance tests. You can then use the conformance tests to make sure your product is conformant and use uh, the trademark and the logo. But developers, developers who are using the APIs to create applications, uh, they have free use of the APIs. Uh, the APIs will be typically shipped along with the system and the developers can use them uh, as they wish. So we have a good cooperative model uh, in Kronos. The, um, the specifications that we produce are actually quite valuable. There's a lot of work that goes into creating these specifications. We added up um, uh, the total effort. There's been hundreds of man years have been invested by industry leading experts to create these API specifications. And yet they're offered to the industry royalty free. And how do we protect uh, those specifications? We have a very well defined IP framework, intellectual property framework. And all of the Kronos membership agrees not to assert patents against each other for conformant implementations of the specifications. So if one company uses uh, the specification, creates a product that is conformant, all of the other 100 Kronos members agree not to sue them for patents uh, for that API. And as you probably know, in the mobile industry today, there's a lot of uh, litigation, a lot of patent activity. So this is a very valuable uh, protection. So we've created a safe environment with a solid legal framework for the industry to come together and to cooperate to build these APIs uh, that moves the industry forward. Some people ask, how does Kronos make money? And the answer is Kronos doesn't make money. We are a non-profit organization. We do have fees for membership and adopter programs, but they're quite small. Uh, we try to keep the fees as low as possible so any company can join. Um, we need those fees to just cover our costs. Kronos doesn't make a profit. Kronos is existing to create market opportunities for our members and the industry. So becoming conformant is key. Uh, you don't get the IP protection unless you're a conformant. 
So how does a company who's thinking of implementing a specification, how do they become our conformant? Well, we have an easy process. The first step is the company executes an adopter's agreement, uh, which gives them access to the source code for the conformance tests. There's a small fee, it's about $10,000 per API, but that lets you test as many products as you wish. And you can begin to use the trademark as soon as you sign the agreement in a restricted way. The company then takes the source code, ports and executes the tests on their uh, product. Once they have passing the tests, they upload the results for review by the Kronos Working Group. And once the review is complete, they can use the full trademark and logo and uh, they get promoted on the Kronos website. And they get the IP protection of the IP framework. So that's how Kronos works. So what is Kronos being um, actually producing? What are the trends, the large trends, over the 10 years that Kronos has been operating? How have the APIs changed in character over that time? When we started 10 years ago, uh, mobile devices didn't need APIs much. And the main activity was on desktop uh, and workstation devices. OpenGL was the 3D API for workstations. And now we have companion APIs like OpenCL that are also initially bringing compute, parallel computation to workstations and servers. And even today, new API technology is often generated first for high-end systems. But increasingly, the innovation now is moving over into the mobile industry. Mobile is the new platform where lots of uh, application innovation is happening. We need to enable those applications with state-of-the-art APIs that not only give good functionality, they're designed to operate at low power because these mobile devices, of course, are operating on batteries. And a few years ago, it was okay for those APIs to exist independently. You'd have a graphics API and you'd have a video API. You didn't really need them to talk to each other very much. That's now changing. This is where we are today. We're finding that we need to have close cooperation between all of the different APIs. We need the graphics and the video and the sensor processing and the vision processing all to be uh, working together seamlessly because we want to support new classes of application like uh, augmented reality. And we'll explore that in just a second. Everything in the phone needs to work together uh, in real time. And so Kronos is beginning to make sure that the APIs that we have interoperate uh, in a good way. And these mobile devices are becoming more and more packed with sensors, motion sensors, multiple cameras, positioning devices, geographic positioning devices. Um, they all need to be made accessible to the application programmer. And then the next wave, I think, which is already starting is the use of HTML5 as a cross-OS programming platform. More and more devices are being enabled with graphics and compute-rich uh, silicon. The silicon is getting cheaper and low and lower power. It's getting into cars, consumer electronics, TVs, DVDs, mobile phones. Um, Application programmers need to be able to write an application once and have it run in many different places. Uh, HTML5 looks like it could be uh, that cross-OS uh, programming platform. But that means that the HTML5 needs to have a lot of functionality, just like the native APIs do. And I'll explain how we're bringing to, uh, beginning to enable uh, advanced functionality uh, in the browser. So let's look at... Um, Augmented reality, it's an interesting use case. Um, this is where you take uh, a mobile device, you grab the video stream, you do feature tracking on objects in the scene, so you know exactly where the phone is pointing in relation to the, its environment. So you can create 3D objects and 3D information and overlay it, compose it back together with the video to create a scene that is augmented with this additional uh, information. It can be used for entertainment, it can be used for uh, information. This is a very demanding use case. To be useful, it has to operate in real time. 
ideally 60 frames a second. Uh, there's a lot of processing required. So what are some of the processing we need? One is to uh, handle all of these different sensors. The cameras, uh, the motion sensors, um, they all need to be handled in a, in a uh, seamless way. And the applications need to be isolated from the specific details of each device. Even though every mobile phone might have a different camera or a different accelerometer uh, or, or different gyro with different characteristics, the application developer needs to write a program once and have it run portably across many different types of platform. Stream input is an API that is being developed to let the application request high-level semantic information. Say, if you're doing a connect type game, the application can request skeleton tracking information, and then that information will be provided by the middleware and the stream input API on the device without the application having to know the details on how that was created or even necessarily which particular sensors were used to create that information. It means that the device can find the best way to provide that information and the application programmer works at a portable high level. It seems like a, um, a magic uh, API, uh, but we have some really good companies working on this. For example, PrimeSense, that is the developer of the camera in the Kinect. Uh, they have a proprietary API for driving the Kinect. Um, which is on the Xbox, um, and they've con contributed that API to the process working group. And their prime competitor, SoftKinetic, is also in the working group. They're now the specification editor. So these two competitors, the leaders in the field of 3D depth camera sensor processing, are now working together in the Stream Input working group uh, to create an API that will apply to many different types of sensors uh, and frameworks. We're working to ship stream input specification in 2012. Another key part of new generation applications is vision processing. Augmented reality is a great example. The vision and object tracking, you need to analyze uh, objects uh, in the video stream. There have been uh, computer vision libraries in the industry for a while. You might have used OpenCV, an open source library for computer vision, very extensive library, lots of functionality, about a thousand different functions. But it's been traditionally difficult to accelerate. Um, NVIDIA, for example, has put like 20 of the OpenCV functions in, uh, over CUDA, but there's now 900 more functions to go. It's a too big a task. So Kronos is now defining OpenVL, V for vision a set of accelerated core vision operations that libraries like OpenCV uh, or applications directly can use to have a hardware accelerated vision processing. And again, we have many of the industry's leading experts, including the developers of OpenCV uh, in the working group, figuring out how we can create an OpenVL library that can be implemented by the silicon vendors and used by the computer vision libraries and applications. And again, we're looking to ship OpenVL uh, in 2012. So a lot of new um, work going on now at the Kronos Group. In fact, we can, for the first time, only just for a few months, we've been able now to draw an augmented reality processing flow that uses 100% open standards. Uh, so let's see how standards work together. The first thing we want to do in augmented reality is to control the camera in quite sophisticated ways and to do low-level image processing close to the sensor. Uh, we can use OpenMax AL and you'll hear more about that later uh, today. We want to feed the video data into computer vision tracker and that tracker can be implemented using OpenVL or OpenCL we need to combine that tracking information using the camera as a sensor with the other sensors in a device, the motion sensors, for example. That sensor fusion operation is uh, the domain of stream input. 
We want to generate the 3D graphics and composite those graphics with the video. Uh, we use OpenGL ES for the composition and the graphics. And we use EGL, which is an API that connects the video to the graphics subsystem uh, to provide very efficient data transfer with no copies from the video subsystem into the GPU. And then last but not least, we want to have audio, perhaps with 3D positional uh, audio, and we can use OpenSL ES uh, for that step. So we have a lot of uh, innovation happening around uh, vision and multiple layers of uh, functionality, but they all kind of fit together. So OpenVL is uh, the new uh, standard. You could use OpenCL for compute to implement OpenVL if you wish. If you're using OpenCB, a high level uh, vision library, you can use OpenVL uh, to implement uh, OpenCB and get harder acceleration. You're going to want feature and object tracking as part one of your stream input sensors. Uh, you can use uh, uh, stream input to integrate feature tracking with the rest of the sensor network. We're also going to make sure that OpenMax AL for camera and low-level image and vi video processing can interoperate with OpenVL. And we're going to make sure it, OpenVL also interoperates with OpenGL and OpenGLES and OpenCL. So you can do vision, compute, and graphics uh, very efficiently uh, within, within a system. So having these APIs well-defined is great, uh, but if they don't actually ship in a system, of course, they're no use. No one can use them. The good news is that Kronos APIs are being widely adopted and shipped uh, throughout the industry. Android is one mobile OS. It looks to be the most widely deployed mobile OS today. Uh, many more Android devices now shipping than uh, iOS devices, for example. Um, and uh, Android has been adopting Kronos APIs over the last few years. OpenGL uh, ES 2.0 has been shipping uh, in Android since Android 2.2. OpenSL ES for audio has been shipping since Android 2.3. In the latest release, Android 4.0, that's ice cream sandwich, uh, OpenMax AL is now shipping uh, as a standard part of the platform. We have EGL, which is this uh, uh, surface buffer management API, has been in Android for many years, but it, now it's getting more and more exposed directly to the application developer. We have more APIs in the pipeline, like OpenCL and Stream Input and OpenVL. They're not yet adopted, but we're working hard to create good APIs that add value to any OS, and so we're hopeful that Google will adopt them over time. But even before the, uh, Google adopts them officially, Android has enough flexibility that you can add extensions uh, to Android and ship these uh, APIs before they're uh, part of the standardized platform. Uh, the NDK, the Native Development uh, Environment in Android, enables you to add extra APIs. You don't want to break the Google APIs that would cause applications to break, but adding new functionality on the side uh, enables uh, platform vendors to differentiate without disrupting existing applications. And because we're using open standards to add this functionality, um, each different platform has the opportunity to add the same uh, functionality so we can drive the platform forward uh, without fragmentation. Lastly, uh, one of the other initiatives that we have this afternoon that Elizabeth will be talking more about is that we want Kronos to work closer with the ed education community. Kronos is not going to start teaching about Kronos APIs, but we want to help educators <coughs> that are teaching Kronos APIs to have better information from the industry and more assistance from the industry to be able to better teach about Kronos APIs. And so the whole KITE initiative, the Kronos Institute of Training and Education, is going to be set up to enable close cooperation between industry 
and the education uh, community, and we'll give you more details on that uh, this afternoon. Lastly, um, we're here in China. We're very happy uh, to be here in China. As I mentioned earlier, Kronos has really prioritized closer engagement with the Chinese industry and education community to benefit both the China industry and the global industry. Kronos needs Chinese participation if we're going to continue to develop standards that truly meet the needs of the global industry. Um, China is taking an increasingly leadership role. So if China is not involved in the creation of these standards, there's something missing and we're not going to truly meet the needs of the industry. So we're very happy to be here um, and we'll be talking to key companies and universities in China uh, this tour and over the next um, few years. In fact, we've been coming to China for a while. Um, this is our second visit to uh, this university and we're here this week in Shanghai and Beijing. We're going to be back uh, soon in uh, July at uh, the China Game Developer Conference and uh, we're really interested to hear from you today uh, what can we do, be doing better to engage here uh, in China. We really appreciate your feedback. So in summary, what I've I hoped I've communicated is that APIs, application programming interfaces, are key to enabling great applications on advanced mobile hardware. And the APIs that we define are really defining what the future mobile devices are going to be looking like. But these APIs, they no longer exist in isolation. They need to work together in quite sophisticated ways. And you'll be seeing some of that throughout the day. Also, we're beginning to see significant need from the web community to bring this native API functionality into the browser and HTML5. We'll be talking more about that later in the day too. So, Kronos, we're driving open standards for hardware acceleration. We welcome your participation and any feedback you have for us throughout today. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions? Yes. What's the difference between open standards and open APIs? Open source. And open source. That's a great question. <laughs> so, the open source is a um, a collection of software that's freely available for the community to develop. Open standards are a specification. You don't need to have open source to create an open standard. The um, we often do have an open source project that is helping to promote an open specification, but it's not a necessary step. And a lot of people get the two confused in their minds. Um, but Kronos, we're not, an, we're not primarily an open source organization. We create specifications. Open source is good. If, it's, if it adds value, but it's not necessary to create a standard that people can implement. Any other questions? Okay, in which case I'd like to introduce John Petty. We're very honored to have John Petty here, one of the industry's leading graphics analysts, and he's going to give us an overview on how uh, Kronos uh, standards have been impacting the wider industry. John.